Beginning in the winter of 1692, the quiet Puritan settlement of Salem, Massachusetts was overcome with hysteria. Stricken with the belief that satanic sorcerers had infiltrated their town, the people of Salem began accusing one another of witchcraft until about 150 people were arrested and 20 of them, most of them women, were executed. In the 330 years since, historians have been left wondering what could possibly have caused such overwhelming and unanimous paranoia in an entire town. The theories range from the mundane to the utterly bizarre, but none of them involve the supernatural, which means that the horrors unleashed in 1692 were not caused by witchcraft, but only by the people of Salem themselves. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's associate editor, Leah Silverman, and today I'll be discussing what caused the Salem Witch Trials. In January 1692, Samuel Paris of Salem Village, Massachusetts, approached his reverend with concern for his nine-year-old daughter, Betty Paris, and 12-year-old niece, Abigail Williams. His girls were succumbing to, quote, grievous fits, during which Williams would clamor around the room, quote, as if she would fly, stretching up her arms as high as she could and crying, wish, wish, wish. Williams also claimed to see invisible spirits and would spontaneously cry out in pain. A local doctor was eventually brought in to examine her, and he declared that Williams and Paris were both under the spell of witchcraft, cast by some unknown sorceress. The belief that certain mortals, or witches, had exchanged their humanity for unlimited power from the devil himself had infiltrated Europe as early as the 14th century, and colored the superstitions of Judeo-Christians from that point onward. And the ultra-pious 17th century Puritans who'd fled England had a special fear of witches as they forged the New England colonies under harsh conditions, plagued with the daily struggles of disease and war with the indigenous peoples there. With so many hardships tormenting such a fervently religious community, perhaps it was only a matter of time before the people of Salem started blaming their troubles on some ungodly force like witchcraft. After Betty Paris and Abigail Williams were diagnosed, the God-fearing residents of Salem quickly conjured a way to weed out the witches they believed to be hiding in their community, and these tests were as bizarre as they were torturous. For instance, they devised a special, quote, witch cake that was supposed to expose the guilty. To make a witch cake, a sample of urine from someone believed to be bewitched was mixed with rye meal and ashes and then baked into a cake. Witch hunters would then feed the cakes to dogs, the animals believed to be the supernatural helpers of witches. If the dogs then acted strangely or showed symptoms similar to those of the accused, that meant the accused was indeed guilty. But would it really be so strange if a dog started acting strangely after eating a cake made out of urine and rye meal? Regardless, soon the authorities in Salem would have more supposed culprits on which to use these tests. Abigail Williams accused the Paris's female slave Tituba, a homeless woman named Sarah Good and Sarah Good's five-year-old daughter, and an elderly woman named Sarah Osborne, of being witches and causing her affliction. The accused were brought before two male judges as their accusers looked on, spontaneously falling into spasms and screaming in pain. Good and Osborne both strongly denied that they were witches, but Tituba confessed, perhaps because that now gave her the advantage of being able to point out other witches, and ultimately, Unlike many of the accused, Tituba managed to escape the hysteria with her life and her freedom. Others, of course, were not so lucky. On June 10, 1692, Salem hung its first accused witch, Bridget Bishop, a resident who was found to have a third nipple, which the town viewed as a sign of witchery. Thirteen more women were hanged before the end of 1693. Five men were hung, and one was slowly pressed to death by stones. And then, as swiftly as the anti-witch paranoia had arrived in Salem... It was gone. Hemsay, Tituba, you work for me. I make you free. And I look. I look. And there was Sarah Good. So how did an entire town come to believe that they were under attack by a horde of witches? One historian thinks that it was all the result of a parasitic fungal infection. In 1976, behavioral scientist Linda Caprell saw a curious similarity between the fits and spasms of the, quote, bewitched girls 
and the symptoms of ergot poisoning. Ergot is a parasitic fungus that can grow on grain under the right conditions and can cause convulsions, hallucinations, and pinching sensations, symptoms which the girls of Salem exhibited. Indeed, children are believed to be the most susceptible to ergot poisoning, and mass hysteria induced by fungal poisoning isn't even unheard of throughout history. For example, in 1518, residents of Strasbourg and modern-day France broke out inexplicably in dance. Hundreds took to the streets and danced uncontrollably for hours and even days, crying as they remained unable to stop themselves. As many as 400 people died of exhaustion, and it may have all been because ergot poisoned their rye. But in the case of the Salem witch trials, Capril concedes that whether or not poisoning was to blame, quote, at the end of June and in the beginning of July 1692, I think there was more imagination than ergot. But by that point in time, three people had already been hung, and the trials had taken a path that people felt they had to stay on, unquote. In other words, even if the accusers had eventually realized the consequences of their actions, or snapped out of their fit of poisoning, the consequences were already too vast and too horrible, and going back on the story now might make them all subject to suspicion. As Capril wrote, Quote, one of the clearest examples is the young accuser who in the late summer said, wait a minute, I don't think there are witches after all. At that point, the other girls began accusing her of being a witch, unquote. Whether or not poisoning was the root of this mass hysteria, that still doesn't explain why it was mostly young women and girls who started out as the most outspoken accusers. And one American author named John Putnam Demos, a direct descendant of John Putnam, a notorious Salem witch hunter, theorizes that that's because of a common phenomenon we all know today as teen angst. As condescending as it may sound that a contemporary male researcher might chalk up an entire town's devolution into madness as the result of a couple bored, hormonal teen girls seeking attention, the idea isn't all that unbelievable. In Salem at the time, children were restricted from almost all forms of play and leisure due to their strict Puritan upbringing. They were expected to spend most of their time doing chores and studying the Bible, and they likely experienced intense boredom, and a boredom so intense, perhaps, that they were drawn to taboo activities and ideas like witchcraft in order to stimulate themselves. Demos posits also that the witch trials were essentially a teenage rebellion against the Puritan authority of an older generation, as most of the accused were adults or vulnerable older women who may have symbolized a future none of these young girls wanted for themselves. He concluded that teenage girls who wanted to challenge the authority of older women and the rules thrust upon them by men became melodramatic and somewhat sinister performers, hungry for attention to their personal plight. But again, as Capril theorized, even if these girls did become aware of the hysteria they'd introduced to their community, the chaos was now out of their hands, and questioning it or trying to call it off would spell their own demise. Life in 17th century America was inarguably difficult, regardless of witchcraft. Homesteaders who were new to this land had to learn which crops grew best on that land, and naturally, there was a lot of trial and error in trying to properly feed their communities. As it happens, the year 1692 lands perfectly within a period of lower-than-average temperatures in North America, known to climatologists as the Little Ice Age. The colder temperatures likely increased the frequency of crop failure, and colder seas meant less fishing. As food became more scarce, the residents of Salem would no doubt become desperate and perhaps search for someone or something to blame. And pointing the finger at witches wouldn't be all that unbelievable, given how superstitious Puritans were. In fact, they often believed that witches could control the weather. Furthermore, a contemporaneous document mentions how Reverend Samuel Paris, whose daughter Betty was the first to become ill because of, quote, witchcraft, was arguing with his parish over the wood supply, meaning there was already a winter fuel shortage at that time. A cold home would have meant a miserable home, and a miserable home might have instigated madness in desperate families. <laughs> 
But what if the cause of the Salem witch trials originated not within the insular community itself, but was instigated by conflicts with Native Americans on the frontier? The Native American wars, which raged throughout the 17th century and sometimes took place close to Salem, may have contributed to the deep fear and paranoia that took hold of the town in 1692. One particularly brutal battle, known as King Philip's War, raged in the colonies not far from Salem. Most people in the region had been impacted by it in one way or another, and this created an atmosphere of intense anxiety. Many were afraid of further attacks and raids from neighboring Native American tribes and fled to new colonies farther south. Several of the girls who accused women of bewitching them had witnessed earlier raids by Native Americans firsthand. It has been suggested that post-traumatic stress from witnessing these terrifying attacks and the culture of fear generated by the continued threat may have played a large role in generating these accusations and the mass hysteria that followed. As if some spell had been broken, the people of Salem realized the horrors they had wrought and apologized. In 1697, a number of jurors who had been on the trials issued a public apology. Quote, We confess that we ourselves were not capable to understand, nor able to withstand the mysterious delusions of the powers of darkness and prince of the air, but were for want of knowledge in ourselves and better information from others, and do hereby declare that we justly fear that we were sadly deluded and mistaken, for which we are most disquieted and distressed in our minds, and do therefore humbly beg forgiveness, first of God for Christ's sake, for this our error. Some of the families of the victims even received financial compensation after the fact, but this admission of wrongdoing is perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the story of Salem. The people of Salem were able to snap out of their delusions and acknowledge the blood on their hands, almost as totally and unanimously as they had fallen into the hysteria in the first place. And so taken together, desperation, illness, and fear are all believed to have inspired this dark chapter in American history. Perhaps it was a combination of some or all of these factors. And perhaps Salem is a lesson in the pliability of the human mind and how, if strong enough, we can be bewitched by our own fear. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.